Welcome back to the 615 Sessions podcast. We got Teresa Walker, Associated Press in the house. Kayla Anderson of WKRN News 2 is here with us as well. Hello, friends. Hello. Hi, Buck. Hi, Kayla. I'm so glad you've got me and Kayla joining you because hello. Let's go. Fresh off vacation, these two. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, well, listen, I've, <laughs> I've tried to have my people get in touch with your people, Teresa, in the last couple of weeks. And apparently you've got things you've got going on. You're drinking in the mountains somewhere. No, 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 no. I was in beach. Marathon. I was drinking by the beach, <laughs> mm-hmm. by the pool, by the kayak, uh, by the wonderfully, wonderfully warm waters of the uh, of the of the Gulf. Yep. See, we just wanted sunshine, Buck, what you're soaking up now. I'd, it's all I've got. This is I, I would do it inside if the, the cats weren't getting ready to riot. It's about time for it's like prison yard time out here. So they had to come out. So I figured we'd do the podcast outside today. Anyway, we've got news that we have to talk about. There's a lawsuit. I mean, there's been a lawsuit. There's a class action lawsuit that Brian Flores uh, has filed against the NFL and three of its member institutions. A couple of additions to that today. Steve Wilkes, former Arizona Cardinals head coach and Panthers defensive coordinator, and Ray Horton, who, of course, Titans fans remember under Ken Wisenhunt and a year of Mike Malarkey as the defensive coordinator here. Uh, Teresa and Kayla, the the situation, the Titans have put out a statement regarding the allegations from Ray Horton that he uh, was interviewed for the head coaching position that Mike Malarkey ultimately got. He is uh, contending that this was a Brian Flores-like situation in which they interviewed him. It was a sham, and Mike Malarkey was always the guy that was going to get the job. So I think that should be the starting point, Teresa, and I know you've just finished your write-up uh, for the AP. That, that was my first season here, Malarkey's, uh, Wisenhunt's firing and Malarkey mm-hmm. taking over as the interim what what do we know what was the tenor of the conversation around that job back then um given that i'm a little lacking in in personal experience from that well i mean that's the thing i mean the whole idea at that time was well you got to see what mike malarkey did in nine games he had a resume with that team and to, to, to put together and it, it did seem like you know i mean it did seem like that was maybe mike malarkey's job to get at that point and you know and the thing that i didn't notice uh, apparently he talked with a a steelers podcast in 2020 and said that yeah they told me that they had this you know that he was told he he had the job and yet we all know i mean that's part of the issues with the rooney rule right is that you know it's been seen so much as checking a box off and ray horton helped check that box off guys here's here's the things to know about that um Mike Malarkey did his interview they interviewed I think Doug Marone that year as well uh Terrell Austin who's also he was mentioned in the first take of this Brian Flores lawsuit uh and then Ray Horton so John Robinson was hired on Thursday January 14th uh interviewed Ray Horton was the last person they interviewed for the head coaching job that interview happened on Saturday morning uh, January 16th, so two days later, they wrapped it up by midday, and a few hours later, the Titans announced that they've hired Mike Malarkey. So, mm. you know, it was a very fast situation, and, you know, and, and then the ironic thing is you look at the hiring of Mike Vrabel. You know, when they did hire yeah. M- Mike Malarkey, that was a five-day process where they interviewed three people, Matt LaFleur, now the yep. Green Bay Packers coach, which looks in hindsight to be a great hire by the Packers and a good guy to have interviewed. Steve Wilkes, who was the other coach who joined the Brian Flores lawsuit today, uh, he interviewed. He was then the Carolina defensive coordinator. And then Mike Vrabel. Mike Vrabel was the first person they interviewed. And five days after, you know, that shoot, I, I was pulling double duty that day as well. I just, I was walking literally in Centennial Park after a Vanderbilt basketball game before going to the Predators when, you know, the, it, the boom statement, we're hiring Mike Vrabel. And it's like, so I, you know, I had a three-story day that day, but, you know, again, Mike Vrabel kind of seemed to be the guy yeah. they wanted from then. Why? Well, read the, read the tea leaves, John Robinson, they had time together with the Patriots and, you know, they, you know, how many times do we look at guys, how many, you know, who's got the Patriot background? Well, these were like two lines going straight together. 
when you look back at 2016, the season that Malarkey was hired, and Buck, I'm with you. I actually joined the crew here at News 2 in Nashville at the start of Malarkey season. So I, I wasn't necessarily in for the hiring process, so I didn't hear all the things that Teresa just listed off. But I certainly heard from Corey Curtis, my my uh, teammate here at News 2, that Last I think it was... podcast guest. <laughs> yes, exactly. Everybody pretty much knew that Mike Malarkey was their guy. And we we also have to go back to the fact that Amy Adams Strunk was still very new at that position. Um, there's a lot of things that were probably not comfortable for her. And Teresa mentioned it. Everything seemed to happen so quickly. And, and I'm not defending the Titans in any way whatsoever. But I do find it interesting now the way that Malarkey went out with John Robinson. We all know that that was not a good situation. There is nothing to sugarcoat about that. And now this podcast from 2020 is uh, showing up all over social media and it comes at the exact time that this lawsuit comes and everything seems to go you know, against the Titans at this point. But again, and you have to look at it from both sides and, and right now we just have to wait and see. But uh, it just seems like such a, a hurried process. But again, the Rooney rule uh, back then while it was a rule, I just don't think that the focus was as much on doing everything the exact correct way. Oh, and in fact, this seems like an appropriate opportunity for all three of us to lay out and for producer Reed to play the audio of the Mike Malarkey podcast, 2020 podcast, Steelers Realm podcast interview that apparently, you know, was on none of our radars until this thing just manifested in the, uh, in the form of a lawsuit in 2022. Well, Mike, if you could turn back the clock, where would, uh, yeah, I probably hate these questions, but. Would there be anything during your coaching career that you might have done differently or changed? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you guys this. Uh, I've always prided myself in doing the right thing um, in this business, and I can't say that's true about everybody in this business. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cutthroat business, and a lot of guys will tell you that. But uh, I allowed myself uh, at one point when I was in Tennessee uh, to get caught up in something I, I regret, and I still regret it. But uh, the ownership there, uh, Amy Adams Strunk and her family came in and, and told me I was going to be the head coach in 2016 uh, before they went through the, the Rooney rule. And so I sat there knowing I was the head coach in 16 as they went through this fake hiring process, knowing, uh, knowing a lot of the coaches that they were interviewing, knowing how much they prepared to go through those interviews knowing that, that everything they could do and they had no chance of getting that job. And actually the GM, John Robinson, he was in on the interview with me. He, he had no idea why he's interviewing me that I have the job already. And I, I you know, I regret that's because I pride myself in my, my kids first that they do the right thing. And I always said that to the players and here I am the head guy not doing it. And I've regretted that since then. It was a the wrong thing to do. I, I'm sorry I did that. Um, but it was not the way to go about it. Should have interviewed like everybody else and got hired because of the interview, not not early on. So that's that's probably my biggest regret. Wow, that's a touching story, and appreciate you sharing that with us. It's yeah, so cool. it's, not, it's not hard. It's not hard to do the right thing. It's really not. That's you can true. get you can get caught up in this business. So that was Mike Malarkey speaking with the Steelers Realm podcast on any regrets about his coaching career, and you hear him go into extensive detail about this whole situation about the regret that he has that he was a willing participant in circumventing the Rooney rule in fact I uh, Teresa's cat has just appeared on the podcast my cat is trying to stick his head under the fence uh, he's trying to test me to see if he can make a run for it while I'm out here and I think I may have to get up and go snatch him real quick this is terrible podcast audio anyway Teresa what do you make of the what do you make of the idea that Amy Adams Strunk was not quite in that role yet and that Steve Underwood was kind of running the team at the time. Well, remember, this was happening in January 2016. She took over in late March 2015. I was up at Sweet 16 in Louisville when I got the release that Tommy Smith was retiring and that she was taking over in the role as controlling owner. And, and that's the thing. She, you know, it, she said herself when she talked to uh, us a few months later that you know, or maybe a year or so later when she finally got comfortable that, you know, she took some steps and took her time to get comfortable in the role, yeah. see what was going on with the team. And, you know, was, you know, her first big step was firing Ken Wisenhunt 
after just an abominable start to a career. I mean, one of the worst tenures as a head coach in the NFL, he was what, three and 23, three and 20. I mean, it, literally, there's only a couple people in the NFL who've ever been worse than that. So she took that step. And, you know, you can understand that she found somebody that she became comfortable with and Mike Malarkey. And uh, she decided that she wanted to try to keep him. And, you know, that's the thing. It's like, it, 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 that's the tough part of this, you know, trying to push diversity, get some, give opportunities to people who absolutely deserve it. Uh, and, and, you know, this is why the Rooney Rule Low has existed, trying to expose you to candidates that maybe you hadn't been thinking about to, to, to do that. And, I mean, there's a reason why the NFL has got this uh, diversity council now uh, that they're going to be trying to work on. But, you know, in, in two hiring situations that Amy Adams Strunk has had, she had a candidate she liked, it seems, in both situations. Well, and yeah, Kayla, it, I mean, to yeah. that point, I, I don't mean to interrupt you there, no, but like, no. it seems it seems that we're that we have this conversation almost cyclically. Obviously, there's been adaptations to the Rooney rule just coming out of the owners meetings a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. in Palm Beach, where they're, you know, they're they're adding adaptations to it to include also women candidates, female sure. candidates for strength and conditioning coaches, for assistant coaches, th scouts, things of that nature. But you go back and look at the teams that aren't employing a female staff member no there's none like they're all already doing it so mm -hmm. they keep making these rules that seem almost i don't, I don't want to say arbitrary like they're well intended but the rule is making the problem more difficult to solve than providing a solution it would seem from my standpoint yeah i think really the more rules you have the more difficult like you said it makes things where i think in any type of a hiring situation and, it, and that includes um, the business that I'm in in TV broadcasting and local news. Uh, if you have a person in mind that you kind of feel like would be the best fit for the job, likely you have a connection with them already that you know their work ethic, you know that they're going to be able to fit in the organization, you're likely to probably go first towards those candidates. Now, that doesn't mean you're bring, not bringing in other candidates and giving them an opportunity. Um, if anything, you're bringing in other co candidates, you might like what they have to offer, maybe not exactly the right fit for you, but you're going to go tell uh, the person at the next station or uh, somebody who else is hiring, this might be the right person for you. Um, I feel like that's still, you're still taking something from from interviewing um, a woman or a minority, uh, because even if they don't get hired there, they could get hired someone else just from word of mouth and, and what you liked out of that interview. Um, the more rules that you add to things, I just think it makes things so much more complicated. Uh, it, it just, now we're looking at this situation where it's he said, she said, or the team said versus um, Horton. So I think I agree with you on that, Buck, 100%. Teresa, what Mike Malarkey's role in all of this, he's going to, he's going to get called in. Like he's going to be, he's going to be put on the stand basically as a part of this lawsuit now um, in a way that I'm sure, well, I don't, I don't know what he anticipated. I don't know what went through Mike Malarkey's head when he decided he was going to go into that kind of detail on a podcast. I don't know what was going through Mike Malarkey's head after the Kansas city playoff win in 2016, when he's <laughs> yelling at us at the, at the press conference, that he's not feeling supported. Uh, from the uh, from the ownership and the administration, the management at the time, because his job had repeatedly come under duress in those last two weeks in a time when, you know, the Titans had not done anything else to speak of in a considerable amount of time. What, what do you make of Mike Malarkey's role, just just his his part to play in this weird story? It is unique. And, you know, Mike is a guy that, you know, I could never get a phone number from Mike, right? And he said that he asked his assistants not to share those, their numbers as well. And, you know, he had, it, well, he's doing know, every damn podcast, apparently, of, other than like the local ones. <laughs> right. So he's calling, he's saying Marcus Mario is not a good enough leader on the Ross Tucker podcast, <laughs> the random Steelers podcast. What the hell? Somebody's got yeah. my numbers. I know. Well, he emailed ESPN and didn't want today and didn't want to follow up and say anything further than no. to add to that podcast thing. So it, it, Mike always feel felt to me like he was kind of part old school and you know and, and you read his comments about how you know he was told he was going to be the head coach and you know he didn't feel right about it because let's remember Ray Horton, who satisfied the Rooney Rule, was his defensive coordinator, yeah. right. mm -hmm. and you know. 
on four days later, he suddenly the Cleveland defensive coordinator because it was it was that awkward. And you know the Fritz Pollard uh, you know representative talked at the time and you know said that Ray was kind of insulted and then Ray mm -hmm. kind of backed off of that. And you know if you're working in an industry, any industry, and you want to stay employed in that industry, you can understand somebody maybe wanting to downplay that and say sure. no 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 that's not what I meant no. Um, and but then you hear Mike Malarkey's comments and it's like part Mike always felt like a loyal guy to me I mean let's you know Terry Rubisky hello so got him fired exactly yeah his refusal to change his offensive coordinator he was loyal to the guys that he brought in yep. so I think that in hindsight he had time to think and and just kind of felt you know he said in those in that podcast that he regrets what he did you know and and it's like it would have been interesting maybe he sends a text saying hey you know, I hear Mike's already got the job and I, you know, who knows, but it certainly, you know, yeah. I mean, I saw one, somebody tweet out a, a sports law attorney saying that that would count as hearsay. Well, guess what? It'll be easy enough if this goes to trial or to subpoena stage to subpoena Mike Malarkey and put him under oath to talk about what he knew and when he knew it. And that could be, let's face it, that could be a bit of a smoking gun, so to speak, for this entire lawsuit. And, you know, and, and, and honestly, guys, I'm going to say this, once the Brian Flores lawsuit was, uh, was uh, filed, I'd been wondering if the Titans would get pulled into this mm -hmm. because of how quickly their last two coaching hiring processes went. I, uh, I think, I think there's a lot of this that's going to be fascinating, <laughs> whether Mike is when he, I mean, because it, it would seem inevitable that he would be subpoenaed on this, whether he's as definitive in his statements on the record under oath as he was yeah. in the podcast, because there was not a lot. I mean, he did not leave any wiggle room uh, for the idea that hey, he literally named Titans ownership, Amy Adams Strunk, uh, going through that hiring process and telling him he had the job before Ray Horton even uh, had that interview take place. But I mean, Kayla, like what, what, I mean, is Mike Malarkey still he comes off as bitter a little bit and yeah I don't know that he's not justified in being bitter I think that it all ended up working out to the benefit of the organization but mm -hmm. I mean the fact remains that there's a rule that they're accused of breaking even if it ended up working out in their favor yeah and look if if Mike Malarkey said this on a podcast he is not a type of guy a who's in my opinion gonna lie I actually worked with him on the coaches show that entire season and while he he was a little bit close to the guard on a lot of things he also you could tell like Teresa said came across as a very loyal guy and those type of people in my opinion uh, they're not going to go on and, and lie on some podcasts what they will do is when you know you're not treated well and things went the way that they did with the Titans and we don't know details to that but we obviously know that the marriage broke and it wasn't it wasn't on a good note um, that you're going to probably at some point when you've retired which it looks like Mike Malarkey has done you're probably at some point going to go out and speak your your truth and so I think that's exactly what he did so if he has to do it uh, in and he subpoenaed then he's going to do it I think it's going to be the exact same thing that he said on this podcast uh, that's what he said the Titans told him and, and I don't think he's lying about that whatsoever it's just a, a situation where unfortunately uh, things like this happen and honestly if that podcast probably wasn't ever recorded maybe this wasn't to the point where it is at this point oh hell no I mean, you, I mean you, said, you said coaches you know retirement and speaking your truth and all that <laughs> bullshit coaches don't coaches don't talk like that in what world I mean, we've been trying to get Mike Rabel to help. I mean, Mike, Mike does have some, you know, even uncomfortably honest Ugh. moments with us. <laughs> right. But like, I, you don't, you don't, this is my frustration with coaches that, you know, that get fired or retire and go into television or broadcasting stuff like yeah. that. They're always hyper protective of sure. their thing because they never know when that opportunity is going to come about. And, and Mike Malarkey is, has retired. He retired as the Falcons yeah. tight ends coach. Um, after last season, I think after the, I think it was last season, 20 season, if I, if memory serves correctly, I believe that was under not Arthur Smith, but, uh, Dan Quinn at the time, either way, this, yep. this is, I mean, it's, we're, it's going to keep us busy. Thank God, because I was starting to, uh, I was starting to get into running back lists and 
AJ Brown trade rumors that aren't actually legitimate. I don't say that name. Don't, don't, don't even speak it. I, you know, it's like, let's not give any credence by even saying those words in the same sentence, please God. Well, Vrabel pretty much came on the Rich Eisen show today and said, as long as I'm the head coach, I'm not interested in trading AJ Brown. So John Robinson made it clear at the owners meetings last week. I mean, how many times do they have to say no? It's like, here's what I compare it to. I might want a Cadillac or a Mercedes or a Range Rover, but you know, me asking it and my husband looking at our checkbook and saying, sure, let's go do it. Two different different things. (laughs) <laughs> the Jets may want A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, but guess what? The teams that have them on their rosters and know what they've got don't have to say yes just because they ask. Sorry. I, got, I was about to say, you're, you. you're, the, you're the one telling everybody to back off it. You're the one going on about it. I'm tired. It, it, it just makes no You're sense You're tired. Whatsoever. I got three hours of talk radio to do with people calling about this for five right? days. That's your job, Buck. You can do Oof. it. <laughs> Teresa Walker, AP. <laughs> Uh, the Associated Press is where you can read her work. Kayla Anderson, WKRN News 2. You can catch their great sports coverage, the entire crew, each and every night. Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you. Back. Back.